Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die, where my goal is to give you evidence that although our bodies will disappear, we survive physical death. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the international best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. Today on the show, I'm thrilled to introduce you to Beverly Brodsky. Beverly was raised in a conservative Jewish family in a mostly Jewish neighborhood in Philadelphia. She went through her teens as an atheist. Since learning of the Holocaust at age eight, she had turned angrily against any early belief in God. However, Beverly has died twice and glimpsed what it is like on the other side. She says that her near-death experience taught her everything that matters in life. This experience has been published in six books, most notably in the book, Lessons from the Light. For over 20 years, she's been a group leader for IANS, which is the International Association for Near-Death Studies, and is a minister in the LA Community Church of Religious Science. There's so much more about Beverly, including she's worked in as a systems and business analyst for the federal government for 28 years. I'll let her tell you the rest of the story. Her website is bevbrodsky.com. Beverly Brodsky, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. Oh, it's my pleasure to have you. And and just so you know, Bev, and our listeners know, I have a little bit of a cough and cold, so every once in a while I might need to mute the button here and if you hear me go quiet it's just because I'm coughing so just bear with me but I'm I'm really thrilled to have you you've been written about and I mean lessons from the light I've read and it's just an incredible book and I would just love to find out a little bit about you and in your story I'm sure you've you've shared it many many times um, but it's an important one and I would you mind sharing a little bit about your past Bev and how you got started in all of this it kind of came to me um, through my experience, and um, I I was on a motorcycle um, on, a, on, a, on a date, um, and we were going. We we were riding on um, without helmets. I had never been on a motorcycle before. And the guy who was driving assured me that this is, you know, this is common. To not wear a helmet? To not wear a helmet, yeah. Okay. So, even though I had always been a cautious person, Mm -hmm. um, I I figured, well, I'm I'm going to, I had just arrived in Los Angeles and um, going up the coast to San Francisco. And I thought, if this is what the natives do here, I may as well go with the flow. Yeah, and and I'm sure this was... How long ago was this that this happened? Uh, Roughly. 47 years ago. 47 years ago. So, 47 years ago, you were probably, like we all were, there was no real fear of being hurt, and we're invincible, and okay, no helmet. Let's go for it, right? Right. And um, and then a a, a driver uh, ran a stop sign, and I could see it head, heading right towards us. And I thought, oh no, it can't end like this. And um, and that was when we were struck. And I really didn't remember, um, you know, that moment of impact, but um, my body does. Uh, I was thrown off the back of the motorcycle onto the highway uh-huh. and um, face down, and I had a fractured skull and, uh, according to the hospital report, numerous broken bones in my head, and um, and so then I went through my or- ordeal of of this pain that was it was I had never really had um, I, I really had been, always been a big baby when it came to pain mm-hmm. 
um, I had one dentist who quit practice after he had me as a patient. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so I was in the hospital for two weeks, and um, I think they had me in a quasi-coma for that time. Mm-hmm. And um, because I was just floating between dimensions, it seemed. And it really wasn't that bad, but um, I remember at some point I, um, in the hospital, I came to a, a moment of lucidity and I was crying to the nurses that, oh, my head is going, I'm going to be scarred and no man will ever love me. Oh. And um, anyhow, um, my, mo- my mo- mother came out to see me and um, um, I didn't go over this st- pro- issue, but I had had kind of a falling out with my mom. And uh, she, she to- told me she wanted to take me home to recover. And, um, and I didn't want to go with her. So, um, so anyhow, in two weeks, I was sent back to to my home, which was a temporary place uh, on the beach where I was sharing a bedroom. Um, I really, they really weren't friends, they were acquaintances. It was just kind of a crazy time. Mm-hmm. And, um, and they, they, when they released me from the hospital, they didn't give me anything for pain. And as I said, I always was a really big baby when it came to pain. Mm-hmm. But, and also I was too inexperienced to know how to argue with doctors, which is a very important skill we should all <laughs> develop. Right. But um, so they said uh, they didn't want to give me anything that would be addictive. I mean, um, it didn't make sense because, you know, um, I really, really did need something. And um, I went home to, to the place that I, I was uh, temporarily staying, and I threw myself on the bed. And I, I was just, at this point, the pain meds were, had worn off. Wow. And I, I was in the most intense pain um, of my life. And I, I, I just threw myself on the bed and said, well, God, if you're up there, and if anybody cares at all, you can have me now because I'm finished. And um, with that prayer, I felt myself lift out of my body and I was in, I was in a perfect body Um, and there there was nothing wrong with my head or with anything else. It was like being in an ethereal body and um, I floated up towards the ceiling. And there was someone waiting for me. I really, I couldn't believe it um, because this this was not part of my belief system. And there was this angel who was up on the ceiling and I, I thought that angels were like fairies and fairy tales. Right, right. I, I thought that they were just a decoration on top of a of Christmas tree, mm-hmm. and um, and I it was like I I looked at, at him and it, this was a male figure, and he just shined from the inside, and um, it was like I was saying to him, "Did did you come for me?" I couldn't, and, and then and then I recognized him. And I can't tell you who it was, but um, he was—he definitely was there for me. And um, 
and he he was wearing like these flowing white robes and he shined from within like a lantern mm -hmm. and he took my hand such as it was because he was also in his ethereal body and we went flying together through the window and I had no fear it was like I'd always been flying through windows funny <laughs> yeah and um so we went it was upward and to the right and we went into this funnel type area that when Ray Raymond Moody's book came out everybody calls it a tunnel right but it seemed to be a, a funnel and um which was like a portal to the other dimension and we were flying through this portal and it was like i had a i knew where I, I was going i felt like i was going home it was just amazing it was like leaving the space-time continu continuum and entering into a realm of eternity and um <laughs> so at some point i emerged from the other end of this funnel and the angel was gone but there before me was the living presence of this being of light and now this was um years before raymond moody wrote the book there was nothing in the li literature about this and um but um I was just completely um, surprised and amazed and angry. I had been very angry at God for a long time. And I looked at this being which contained everything that ever is, was, and will be. And just com contained complete knowledge and wisdom of how everything works and was unconditionally loving me and welcoming and blessing me and um, I could not accept accept this that I could not accept this I said well this isn't the guy on top of the Sistine Chapel there was no face or you know, there there was nothing there, there was no specific thing but I said I guess this is God and I had a few words I needed to say <laughs> I, I, I needed to get out and what happens is your thoughts and feelings go out automatically telepathically mm -hmm. so um, I got to ask my big questions like um, if there if there really is all this love why do we suffer and why are we at war and why the holocaust and um and i don't remember my questions but i did get comp like a complete download of the perfect answer that explained why why these things happen and um it seemed to me that um and this i do remember I remember very clearly that i thought to myself oh of course oh i already knew that how could i have forgotten and um it was just amazing that um that eventually i had no more questions because i got the whole picture i knew how things worked and it was all very simple. Um, like we were all interconnected, uh -huh. but we each, we have free will and we're little individual sparks of that great uh, giant flame, which is the divine. And we are part of the divine. And we agree when we, when we come here to forget who we are and we take on this this identity this role of the individual that we call beverly or sandra or whoever mm -hmm. 
and um, and we you know we create from from that place of unknowingness I don't know how else to explain it but um, but however we really are our soul is still part of this this identity and uh, I finally was able to accept back to my experience I finally was able to accept the love that was being offered and I just kind of melted into like I felt like I didn't have a body at this point and mm. uh, the um, being of light took me on a tour of the universe which was so ex oh it was so exquisite um, and all of the stars and all of the galaxies were so loving um, they were alive like our earth is alive too and and so there and also there were no spaces there was no darkness there there was um, there there was just going to from radiance to radiance and um, ah it was it was fantastic I, I really don't even have words to express um, all that I saw but um, finally we went into the center of this newly formed star or Sun and then we went through another portal and um, when we entered into the this, this star and then everything vanished there was no more light and the being of light the presence was still there and also the um, the essence of everything that ever will be but it was like going back to the the place um, before the Big Bang or before let there be light wh whatever your belief system mm -hmm. is and um, and there was nothing and yet everything um, and it, it was here that I melted back into this primal unity and oneness and um, I remembered that I had been Beverly, the girl on the bed who cried out to God in despair and and yet here I was I was one with everything and with the light itself and um, it was like being a drop in the cosmic ocean um, it was like I, I remember that I, I was a drop on this wave and that I was, you know, that I was just me, and yet I was all things. And um, that was the end of my NDE. I never would have wanted it to end because it was so perfect. And actually, I believe it never can end because this happened in the realm of eternity. Um, and um, I, I was, I found myself back in that broken body but I, I was given um, a healing, a soul healing. I knew without a doubt that we are immortal, that life is not random, that, um, <laughs> that, that, that our lives matter, and that we, I felt that I had a mission. I wasn't quite sure what it was. But um, one thing I knew for sure is that we are loved. We are loved completely and unconditionally, no matter what we've done. And, uh, and that was so important to me because um, I, you know, of course my parents, being only human, um, didn't share that loving, loving every bit of me. But, um, and my dad had passed on about a year and a half earlier, and, um, and that was 
kind of what triggers this um, the, the dispute between my mom and I. Mm, okay. But um, um, I was I was just given all all of this love and healing, and it's amazing that um, that I was able to re recover fully with, with such a, a a traumatic injury to my head and brain oh definitely uh, when you said you were let out of the hospital after a couple of weeks mm -hmm. i thought oh my gosh how could that be i think it was um that was how much the insurance would pay which oh, is amazing yeah <laughs> that the insurance company would uh control but anyhow um, mm. can, um can i ask you a question you had mentioned that you were getting all your ans your questions answered. Um, yeah. What it, it, something I I believe in life after death. I do, and I believe that life is for a purpose. And I believe that we all come here, and we've forgotten who we really are. So it can make life juicy. You know that we can learn, <laughs> and have emotions, and grow, and all that. But you had mentioned asking about war and suffering. I, I saw my dad suffer a death uh, by cancer that I wouldn't wish on anybody. And as much as I believe, why is there so much suffering? Can you shed any light on that? Because uh, I just, and I, I know you got it in a different realm, um, but do you have any words about suffering? And you also mentioned war. Um, uh, my, my mom had a horrendous death from cancer. Mm, sorry to hear that. Yeah, and um, it, 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 it drove me to do research. And um, uh, what I've learned is that we treat cancer like, like a war. We wage war on the person's body, and um, which is, which is, not right to me it's not medicine to you know and and also we we never let let we don't have a process of dealing with um impending death uh and especially at the time my mom died um which was before there was hospice in this country wow she oh uh, she went through such torture um and really um there are now cases like Anita Marjani of people who've recovered completely from cancer and they've done it from um, letting go of the fear and, and the, um, the and it's a whole system that uh, thrives on darkness and fear and this is my, this is my personal belief mm -hmm. and um, and I think we're, we're just approaching it the wrong way. But they, they do now, because of hospice, people are, they're having their pain controlled to the greatest extent possible. Right. And that was such, such, a, such an improvement over what, what my mom went through. Right. And um, I think with their suffering, it's like, well, with cancer, it never can be, it never can be a, a walk in the park. But um, I believe it's something that, that we were assigned, something that before we come in, we pick certain things that will be our challenges in life. And so it's something that um, we have the chance to master. Um, and, and that is how, how we learn. It just seems strange that we learn through suffering, and there's so much of it. And a lot of it, I think, is because we don't know, like, that we are connected, that we're not alone. Um, it seems like we walk through this, this life alone, but um, there is so much love and compassion. And really, I think what we have to learn to do is to send compassion to ourselves and to others who are, who are suffering and um, uh, war I think is because 
we don't know that we're all one. I mean, if, I, if I'm angry at myself, or I cut off my own hand, this is what we're doing when we wage war, um, that we're all interconnected and part of each other. You know, it's just um, people in other countries are born with different, maybe different skin colors and different traditions, but um, they're still, they're really just other slices of, of God and, um, and of us. And uh, it's just, I think, um, our warmongering and materialism, we cut ourselves off from our greatest sources of healing and peace because um, we think that we erroneously believe that life was meant to be hard. And, and so we make it hard and there's only one winner, whereas we're all, we're all winners. We're all, we're all divine. Um, so, um, I don't know if I answered that question. <laughs> I, I think so. Yeah. I, I do. And, um, you know, I know in my dad's case, had it all not gone the way it did, I would have never learned what I've learned myself and have written the book and started this show and, and so many other things. So the way I, and I don't know if this is the truth or not, but the way I can cope with it is saying, that, you know, dad was my partner in all of this and, and he knew what he was up against. And, um, and lucky for me, I've actually had some mediums that have told me the very same thing so i say okay i use that to empower me but it's hard i just got an email from a woman whose son died in his sleep and uh, she's grieving something terribly and it's it, it's hard it's hard to know the right words to say when somebody's grieving so bad uh -huh. um, and and a, cer a certain part of of the grief that we have is just human you know there's uh, there's some grief that we we're, we're going to suffer because we're f physical beings and we are in these separate bodies. And when someone leaves us, um, we're, we miss them. Yes, and, we do. And in, ca in cases of a child dying, um, we had all of our hopes and prayers for what the person would be. And, um, yeah, so that's really hard. Um, Can I ask you a little bit, um, Beverly, about your 20 plus years working with IANS and hearing stories from other people and um, really learning more about near-death experiences and um, if there's some commonalities to them or... Uh, why were you so passionate about being involved? Well, in because well, because when I first found out about IANS, I had never shared my story, and uh, in fact, um, I didn't know that this happened to millions of other people all around the world. Oh, and um, uh, as I said, the books haven't been written yet. Right, uh, that made this like a normal experience and my mother didn't believe me she thought I was making something up that, that I had a good imagination right <laughs> it was like um, I don't think I could imagine something that would change all my ideas of the purpose of life of who we are and um, anyhow um, it gives me a chance to look give people the power to um, to say their truth without judgment without negative judgment I should say because in the groups we support each other and um, and so um, uh, what, what I've seen is, is that many people have these experiences not necessarily when they're near death which was the idea uh, that Raymond, Raymond Moody picked up, but sometimes it's just when they're going through an, 
they're going through a trauma and like they're um, afraid they're going to die or they're in an emotional crisis and um, and then people can have this same light come to them excuse me and sometimes uh, the same a journey through the same tunnel or darkness going to the light it's like a it's a great um, like just just like a, a wonderful metaphor um, for the process of awakening which is something that everyone does to, to a certain extent um, it's really hard to awaken to who you are when we're in these bodies because you know everything our senses tells us is that we are separate we're so aware of how we're separate entities right so um but but we are but we really aren't <laughs> we're really just a part of each other and a part of the love that create created us and um so um, you're saying common things. Um, people get what they need. Uh, this is what my mentor, Dr. Kenneth Ring, who wrote Lessons from the Light, mm -hmm. uh, this is what he found in his research. And I've heard uh, hundreds of experiences. And I have to agree with him that people get what they need at that moment, which can even be a frightening NDE. Because there are some experiences of darkness and fear and people are transformed it, the proof is in the pudding so to speak we have transformations that come out of these experiences and um, the transformations are the purpose of the experience or even of the accident or the death of a loved one um, you, you're not the same person after you know something like that happens in your life and in retrospect we can always find the silver lining there are great gifts um, that people that people receive through um, what seems to be a tragedy yes it's not really a tragedy it's something that that we sat around and planned, I, I believe, before mm. we came in. Um, Beverly, I had the opportunity to interview Scarlett Lewis a couple episodes ago, and she is a mom who lost her six-year-old boy in the Sandy Hook school shooting in Connecticut. And she went through in the interview and talked about how awful it all was, but she brought up something called post-traumatic growth which sounds very much like what you're speaking of in the transformation, how in these horrific experience, you can really grow as a human being. And, yes. and when you're in the experience, and anyone who's listening right now who's lost a loved one is, is right in the midst of grief, um, you know, if it were me right now, I'd probably get angry because it's the last thing I want to hear. But I think some of us who have had losses in the past and are now maybe years ahead of it can look back and say, wow, because that happened, I met this person or I learned this thing or I went on to help this person. And I find it, I find it very interesting to, to see, and I've, I've heard lots of stories of the growth that does occur. Uh, and, I, and I know it doesn't always. I mean, I think it's also, like you had mentioned in the beginning, we all have free will. Some people choose to die emotionally um, when a loved one dies and get, can get really trapped in grief as opposed to um, being able to use it to move forward. Yes. Yes. Um, you know, if you look at people who haven't had, like, when I was young, I thought, uh, I lost my dad, and um, I had the accident and all of this stuff, and I would look at people who had an easy life, and I would feel jealous, 
you know, full foolishly. Right. I would feel like, well, look at all the stuff I've gone through. But I'm I'm not this kind, same kind of person that they are. That because I, I've learned that I that there is an inner strength that it's possible to um, to grow from from the seeming tragedies that happen in our life. And usually we don't know why the things that happen, why they do happen. But, um, yes, there, there, there can be, if the person is open to it, a post-traumatic growth. Yeah, I like that expression. Why were you so um, anti-God and, and went through the atheist period before this? Could you describe that a little bit? Well, I think because um, when I learned about the Holocaust, it just did not seem possible um, that there was this loving God who created us from um, from love. If that were true, why would there why would there have been um, why it just didn't seem it just didn't make sense to no. me. Right, and and a lot of Jewish people have, have are walking in the darkness caused by the Holocaust, and um, but that's a free will choice. We can choose to use it to shut down and be, and kill ourselves spiritually and emotionally, or we can choose to grow from that and and, and have more compassion for other people other groups that are being killed um, and other um, uh, which is sad that, th that th this is still going on I know. in the world like the Hutus and the Tutus um, they're being killed because of who they are and that, that there's still such a darkness in humanity that we need to we think we need to um we, we need to prove something um, that we're better than, than other people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You had said in your uh, on your website that you'd actually died twice. Um, what happened in your childhood? Do you remember that experience? Oh yes, I do. Um, well, I don't know if I if I died uh, if I actually cl clinically died. Okay. But. Um, uh, in, in the childhood experience, um, actually, it was a, an unusual experience because I went to a scary place, and uh, I was having my um, tonsils out, and I, I must have been seven or eight, and um, and I remember my sister and I, we were close in age, were in the back seat of my parents' car going to the hospital and then like I missed the whole experience of the hospital um, I had amnesia about um, what happened and um, so I went back in, into that memory or, or that non-memory and um, I went back with a a lovely therapist um, and it, so it was sort of a um, hypnotic thing mm -hmm. as she took me back and I did remember counting down for the anesthesia and then um, um, and then in my experience um, I, I was I was with my guides um, and who, who and I and there were, there were these temples of learning, and um, they were trying to steer me in one direction. I wanted to go in the other direction. Okay. And I, and I said, "Oh, please, please, can I can I see this?" And it was. Um, and anyhow, uh, what I saw was um, it was very dark, and um, and. I was seeing like the whole planet like engulfed by
by this dark wave, like molasses, like um, covering the planet with, it was like um, hatred and uh, suffering and fear and rage. And, um, and so I, I came away from that vision and then, um, and the, and I wasn't, they didn't mean to harm me. Um, that's why I guess they felt I wasn't ready for this. Mm -hmm. And then, um, I was in this, a place, uh, it was like a place where there, there were pretty flowers and we were walking through the clouds. And this is what, um, I remembered consciously that I, I was in, um, this beautiful garden and then I was I was so my sister and I were recuperating in this room where, where that we shared and I said um, and and somehow she woke up and 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 she said well Beth are we dead and um, so and it's funny because she doesn't remember this now but um, I was kidding her, and I said, oh, I, I think your face just melted, <laughs> you know, sisters. So then she, she was crying, and my, my mother came upstairs with ice cream <laughs> um, because that, I guess that was the, the remedy for having your tonsils out. Ice cream makes it all better, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and um, that was in, in real life. And what I decided to do with this experience was to change the ending so that I wasn't left with that awful memory. Um, and, and I went into the darkness and it was kind of like, you know, the yin-yang sign? Yes. Um, and when we went through, what, what I saw was all darkness. But when I went into the darkness, there was a tiny pinpoint in the center of light. And, um, and then I saw that there was this connection with the realm of light that I had seen in my adult experience. And that that's always there. And in fact, there probably is some dark, darkness in the realm of light that people can get stuck in. Um, and so it was like I forgave the darkness because that's part of, we, we live in um, a realm of duality here yes. where we have these two extremes that there can be um, the darkness and the light and love and hate or fear. Um, and, and it's just part of our experience and um, to choose to go back to the light um, is a very powerful choice that we have. Yeah. It's interesting you mentioned um, those negative or dark near-death experiences. Two of the two gentlemen that I interviewed had the experience of real dark and real gloomy and they had life reviews and were look, look back on their past and they were not good guys and it's interesting you said the pinprick of light because they both described it as a little pinprick of light opened up and instinctively they started praying and then the light got bigger. And I think we do need the light or the dark to know that there is light. We do need duality. Um, my sister just met a man on an airplane and she says, oh, my sister interviews people that have had near-death experiences. She's got this radio show. And the guy responded that he had had a near-death experience, but it was so dark that he never wants to die. So it actually frightened him to live, I mean, to die. And um, she spoke to him a few more minutes. And I just kind of got the instinct that there, there might be some of us who, if we know that there's this great world beyond that we might choose to go there and skip out on being here on planet earth I'm, I'm no expert on this at all but um i do think and maybe you could shed some light on this too that life is for a purpose for our soul and so that we shouldn't be in too much of a hurry 
to die and, and go home. Would you agree? Yes. Yes. Well, you know, um, the message of the NDE is about living. It's about how we live, even knowing that there is this, you know, this other place that we can go to. And um, the, the early researchers, when IONS was first forming, uh, there was a lot of fear about um, that people would commit suicide when they heard these stories. Right. It would be so much easier. But the thing is, like, killing yourself is like shooting yourself in the foot before a rape. Um, because I, I, I believe that even though I didn't have this experience in my NDE, I believe that all of us will review our lives when we're on the other side um, from the perspective of the all-knowing, um, loving spirit that we are. And um, so... Um, I had this one person I interviewed who um, who had um, a, a very dark NDE, but um, he received a gift from it because he was um, he was doing drugs and drinking, and his girlfriend was um, pregnant with with her first baby, and he just quit everything cold turkey and he said well that, my, that baby is not going to know her father from the person that I am rather than the person that I, I am becoming mm. so then he he turned away from his own darkness and he, he used he, he did have a fear of death but he used that to change um, um, to change who he was so That's a great thing. That would be a very po positive experience. Sure. Wow. Bev, do you have any closing words? I'm looking at the clock and our time goes by fast as it always wow. does. Anything <laughs> that you're up to or that you're passionate about or words of wisdom? Listening to us now, we have people who are in search of answers. We have people that have lost a loved one, want to make sure they're okay. Um, we're in all all human beings, and so I don't know if there's anything that's in your heart that you just any closing words you want to say. Well, um, I agree with your book title that we don't die, and um, for people who um, for people who who are who are wondering about their lost loved ones, I think the greatest lie that we've been told is materialism which tells us that when we die poof it's just like a candle blowing out right and and life is like meaningless like if you believe that which i did for many years um but that's it's just not true and if you look at all of the evidence um and and, and go to a medium or um, ha have um, your own there's something called induced after death commu communication mm -hmm. and there there are other ways of getting in touch with a person um, for me with my father I had dreams about him uh, for a year after he died um, and um, and and in those dreams, he was real. Um, he would come back and he would say he, how sorry he was that he left the family. And, um, and, but, but anyhow, um, if you look at all of the, the experiences that people have, there is no way that all of these are just made up stories because, um, if you have a dream or a hallucination, most most of them, um, you don't you don't change afterwards. You say, "Oh, well, that was just crazy. I just had that crazy idea," and then you go back to your old self. 
but when you have um, an NDE or a spiritually transformative experience, you never go back to your old self. Right. Because um, you've learned something about life and that life is, we're here on a great adventure. And um, it's just that we can't see the whole thing right now. Um, but when, when we pass on, we will understand why we had the experiences, the challenges that, that we did have. And it will all make sense. And everyone we've ever loved, including pets, will be there for us. Oh, I love that. Oh, thank you so much, Beverly. Oh, you're, you're so welcome. I'm just so honored to be on your, on your program. Oh, I'm honored to have you. Absolutely. And uh, just a note to our listener who's listening right now. During this episode with uh, Beverly Brodsky, um, she brought up some neat things. She, she had mentioned Anita Morjani who wrote a book called Dying to Be Me, and literally she had a near-death experience and her cancer was healed, and she was pretty far gone. Uh, it's an excellent, excellent book. Um, and then you've also mentioned IANS, uh, and you mentioned induced after-death communication. And for anybody who's interested in finding out more about those, if you go to we don't die radio dot com and check out Beverly Brodsky's episode, um, which is episode 96, I do believe. I will have links to all of that. So you can just click on them and find out more just to make life easier. And also, Bev, your website is bevbrodsky.com, correct? Yes. Yes, and that's spelled B-E-V-B-R-O-D-S-K-Y.com. So in closing, Bev, thanks once again for being here. And thank you, Sandra. Really it's enjoyed been a it. Real pleasure. Thank you for the difference you have made for so many years, Bev, in so many ways and in so many lives. And even your involvement with IANS, letting people know that their story is valuable and that they're not going crazy and that it's normal what they've experienced. You've really helped comfort some people. Uh, so thank you for all the good you've done and that you'll continue to do. I do, th I do believe when we have our, those, um, uh, when our lives flash before our eyes, you know, that when we cross over that we actually do also see the good that we've done in the world. And I know that you will see, many lives transform because of uh, your words, Bev. So you're an angel on earth. So are you, Sandra. Aw, thanks. And our listener, I thank you for taking the time to listen because I want you, beyond anything, to have a life beyond your wildest dreams, to know that you are an infinite creature that you are loved, that you have people around you, both visible and invisible, that are supporting you on your journey. Your life is for a purpose. Uh, that, uh, in the words of Bed Brodsky, we are all on earth to have a great adventure. And one day, we will all understand, and it will all make sense. So I'd like to close the show with that. And remember, you can go to wedontdieradio.com, listen to any of these episodes, any of the past episodes. You can click on a link that says Join the Insiders Club, and I've got all kinds of special freebies for you if you dare to take the risk. And in closing, this is Sandra Champlain. I've been your host on We Don't Die Radio. I do believe that life is an education for the soul and that your life here on Earth is important. So I challenge you to make today a great day. And I want to thank you for listening, and we'll see you soon.